to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
changes, and so now this is our opportunity to get our final thoughts into this and give the administration you know, a, a way forward. What do we want to do next? So that's why we're here. Let's get started. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And uh, we don't normally comment on uh, public comment. I just want to thank folks for taking the opportunity to, to come forward and, and share their thoughts with us. And, you know, I think the reason why we involve so many people in the process, and we'll, there's a couple slides that speak to the number of community interactions we had, um, I think it's really important to do that to get as good of a direction as we can. Um, we talked to over 600 people since September, face to face, eyeball to eyeball, um, from middle school age students to you know some of our oldest you know alumni and everybody in between, uh, parents, staff, business owners local or the elected officials um, to try and, and just throw some of these ideas out there, see what was going to gain traction, what got pushed back. Um, it's been a lot of work, a lot of work to, to fine tune this plan and we hope for further fine tuning tonight. And my primary goal uh, with the board this evening is to uh, present our recommendation and there's a range of options that the presented with provided number to support and to give us as administration a clear direction. Uh, for our March 6th meeting that we present a resolution to you that, you can, that we can support as, as a unit. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll move forward. Thank you all that stuff. Yeah. We'll have a different presentation here. No, we got you. Okay. So what are our goals? I think this is really important to take um, a moment before we dive into specifics if we don't understand what the goals of any organization are or of this plan. Um, we're going to fail to understand what limits our vision and what informs it. Um, I think I'm not going to read all these to you. I think people can, can peruse these. Um, I think some important bullets to point out, bottom of column one, the maintenance of our current year-round program <coughs> offered to kindergarten to eighth grade is going to be an option for families in this new uh, 2020 vision. Um, we want to further expand our role in the community. What, what does that mean? We have spent considerable resources to make the peer community schools a more legitimate partner in the community with local businesses, and that has been to our collective benefit. We want to continue to expand our role uh, and be a more viable partner for businesses other than just asking them for money to support local organizations and sports teams and donate money to the football program. Um, we have a, a, a very rich and deep um, connection with our, our local business community, and they have a lot to offer our students, and we want to expand that. Um, and we want, we do want to reduce the overall footprint of the district. That's the, the last bullet. We, we have an opportunity here to streamline the operation, to save operational dollars, to operate fewer buildings, and to be more in line with the number of students that we have to service and the number of buildings that's going to require to do so. I think that's really important to understand. I think some people, um, you know, there's a range of reaction to this. Wow, this is a lot of reduction, closing a lot of buildings simultaneously, um, a lot of change all at once. <laughs> but in my time talking to the community, I've also heard a lot of feedback like, we like it, why is it going to take so long? Why can't we do this sooner? Questions like, what happens if the bottom doesn't pass? Right? What are the options then presented to the district? We'll talk about all that tonight. But I think it's important to say most of these, most of these bullet points, if you look at them, really speak to growth, expansion of academic opportunity, creating a better product educationally that we deliver to the students and our families, but we also have to keep a very keen eye on the finances that are required to do that and, and let our taxpayers know that we're going to do so in a fiscally responsible way. So the process, very quickly to review this, um, we created a strategic plan in 2012 and we have been monitoring that and its implementation since uh, since it happened. We've had about a little over a year long kind of internal deliberation about what some of the things that you're about to see would mean. Um, focus panels, focus groups, um, surveys, video presentations, community engagements. Uh, we have a, a consulting firm, Bonnick & Bonnick, that uh, works with local school districts and municipalities to gauge where people in the community are at on initiatives like this. And as I said earlier, talked to over 600 people along the way since September. 
Um, this proposal evolution um, for the board is, um, if you look on the left there, um, you can see that uh, the initial community engagements prior to, prior to going public with this, um, what we had proposed. Um, and uh, you can see the number of iterations it went through as the focus groups and the community groups and staff groups got a hold of it. Lots of different changes. Uh, a couple of aspects down there at the bottom. The site location of central office, alternative event and virtual learning varied throughout the entire process where this facility might be, where our alternative setting might be, where some of the programs that were housed in the Center for Innovation, where they might end up. Um, lots of feedback on, on those issues. Uh, if those of you that were at the initial focus panels, you heard a lot of discussion about community uh, groups wanting to share some space with us and what that might look like. That's gone through several iterations. Um, and the final focus group um, presented the, uh, the, the concept you see there on the far right, uh, which we'll talk a lot about today as the final, uh, final configuration proposal. And we'll talk about some of the benefits and the drawbacks of that. And just for everyone's um, information, this presentation will be available on the district website um, before the end of the week. So if anyone's, you know, vigorously taking notes, don't worry, all this will be made public. So what is our plan after, after all of that? So our proposed district structure <laughs> utilizes these six facilities. The second row is the grade level configuration at, east of, at each of those sites. So we want to maintain Turl as an early childhood center. It is our most recently renovated elementary facility as an early five and kindergarten center. And the student population numbers is the, is the fourth, uh, fourth row. The current high school, or what we title as the East Campus, would be home to our elementary program grades one through four. Roland Warner would be a intermediate school concept grade housing grades five and six. Zemmer, a middle school concept housing grades seven and eight. The West Campus would be home to our new comprehensive 912 high school. And we would convert Schechter Elementary into our alternative high school and virtual learning center, both housed at the current center for innovation. So what you don't see uh, here are a number of uh, current buildings. Um, Maple Grove, which the district still owns, houses, uh, we rent the majority of that facility to community mental health. We maintain a portion of the facility for some virtual learning. We maintain that. Our operational costs, as you know, are basically covered uh, by our rental agreement with community mental health. The Crampton facility, which is home to our uh, the Peer Homeschool Partnership, will be maintained as such. The bus garage will be maintained as the current uh, transportation center. And this facility, the administration and service center, will remain intact. If anyone else I want to say on this particular slide. So this is the this is the structure. We currently operate 13 buildings in the district, including the ones I just mentioned. This would reduce the number of uh, buildings to 10. We would close and market for sale. Mayfield, Lynch, and Murphy Elementary Schools. As the board has seen in the packet we were sent earlier this week, there is money set aside in the bond for uh, site viability costs for those three buildings to make sure that they um, are maintained and stay marketable throughout that process. Um, as we know from the White facility, they might not sell as fast as you want them to. So you gotta <laughs> put some money in the market and maintaining them. So let's talk just for a brief moment about how this ended up in this fashion. And, and again, please don't hesitate to ask any questions throughout. I don't have to get to the entire process to, to wait to answer questions. Um, considerable discussion, if we're just focusing on the elementary program at the focus groups that uh, our board members attended, on uh, concern about the original proposal which called for uh, only one or two grades in an elementary facility. For example, uh, like grades one and two at Roland Warner, grades three and four 
at Zemmer, and then we had a proposal that had grades five through eight at the East Campus site as a middle school facility. A lot of concern about the number of transitions. Um, really wanted to keep our elementary program, um, the bulk of it, uh, for three or four year experience for our kids, um, but also a lot of discussion that our current elementary facilities are really insufficient uh, from a number of uh, aspects, particularly when you look at things like a lack of access to uh, elective facilities like tech labs, gymnasiums, art music rooms, science laboratories, things like that that we just don't have independently at each elementary facility. But if you were to adapt one of our secondary facilities, they would have access to all those types of things. The other piece that came up quite a bit in discussion about the East Campus as a, as a conversion of Lapeer Elementary housing this many students is the idea of breaking the building up into pods. Right? So instead of having, uh, let's say, 1,200 first and fourth graders throughout the entire building, that the East site lends itself very nicely to um, uh, sectioning off parts of the building for first graders, second graders, third graders, and fourth graders and then um, having separate office structures to service each of those grades. So, um, you know, secretaries aren't processing all sick kids and all parent calls and everything at the same at, at one site that we could, we could um, divide some of that, that workload. So the site itself lends itself very nicely to that. Um, this idea was put before um, every member that attended the focus groups and they had a number of options to consider. This was far and away the, pop, the most popular and well-received choice for a variety of reasons, um, the one most of which I just mentioned. So the idea of transitions, uh, the idea of uh, having access to a secondary facility really spoke to folks. And if you look at how things are divided, students in early five all the way to fourth grade are pretty much on the east side of town. So from a transportation perspective, sharing the staff perspective that makes that a little bit easier. And then students in grades five through 12, uh, ostensibly on the west side of town. Keeping Schickler as part of the plan uh, really came down to evaluating the use of this particular building. The original plan called for uh, ASC to be converted into the alternative high school and virtual learning center. But the cost to replicate this facility someplace else just proved to be too great. And that was a pretty easy reduction. Um, board members in the committee process had some really good input on that particular uh, cost. Um, but to convert Schickler into a secondary facility is relatively cost effective, um, as you saw uh, from the packing percent. So, and its proximity to the rest of our secondary facilities makes sense uh, in terms of kind of right here in that central part of campus with, you know, Mott and Will um, Warner and Zemmer and then New High School. So that works. So at the bottom, we've obviously got some minor, moderate, and substantial renovations to happen at each facility. And, you know, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I know a lot of people, a lot of questions I got from parents in particular, looked at this and said, holy cow, how are we going to do all this at once? And if and when the board moves to support this, this configuration plan and then subsequently the bond, and then if and when the bond is supported by the community, we have a three-year window to develop the transition timeline, to figure out from a construction perspective how each facility will be upgraded over that time period, and then how we'll transition all staff and all students simultaneously in the same year. So uh, we'll get to the timeline in a moment, but just to, to jump ahead uh, for those that are still uncertain of this, none of this goes into effect, this configuration, until the fall of 2022. So 2022-23 school year, when this plan will go into, go into effect. So we have essentially that much time from November 2019 until then to plan for the transition. So costs. The, you have been given, and I want to point to your packets that you can provide at your table. You have, if you look at the third page, the third page in, it looks like this. It has priority one, priority two, and priority three costs contained in it. Okay. 
So in the building by building breakdown, you'll see that same, those same three columns highlighted in the far right. What the, what the administrative team is recommending is the priority one, this first line, a total of $97.7 million for the entire project. And you can see, if you look in the green column, every single item by building, what that entails. That being said, in the committee process, when we initially presented this plan to you, there were some members that wanted to see a plan that was less than 90 million. And what could we reduce out of the original plan to get to that number? We will also identify for you what things we removed from priority one to get to that 89.8. We also had some members that said, we think this is an opportunity to ask for everything that you think you could possibly need in the future. And the total of that proposal would be 102.5 million and include all items articulated in priorities one, two, and three. So essentially what we have today, our challenge before us, is to look at the proposals ranging from 89.8 to 102.5 and identify which items you're comfortable as a full board including or removing from that list. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. In, in this first packet where you had the proposed evolution and the prior community engagement to have the campus website as community center, we don't have community center here. So is that idea we will talk about that. Table? Great. Let's talk about it right now. Okay. Great question. I'm just like, no, is thank that, you. where are we at with that? I've only said this about 800 times, so I've forgotten a couple of things along the way. Um, no, the, que the question for the members that didn't hear it is, the original proposal included this community center idea. The final proposal doesn't have that, that language in it. Um, didn't, from our perspective, Jan, did not get the support, the widespread support we had anticipated for that concept. And essentially what we were talking about was partnering with local uh, organizations, other public institutions, private entities to come in and provide services to both the community and our student and staff population simultaneously. We did, however, hear a lot of support for the idea of local businesses having the opportunity to utilize our facilities, let's say after hours on the weekends for trainings, development, that kind of thing, and also more, let's say, project-based learning spaces where they could come in and work side-by-side -side with their kids. We still are talking to groups like um, McLaren, who uh, still have significant interest in providing like registered nurse services to our kids, um, may perhaps having a clinic in there, um, but to call it a community center probably wouldn't make a lot of sense. It just wasn't the widespread support for well, that I was concerned because um, I used to work at the health department and bringing in immunizations is a great idea. But we used to do satellite clinics in here in North Branch, and you can't do that with the chickenpox vaccine. Okay. Because so there's limitations. It's a, it's, a, it's a live virus, and it has to be kept in a freezer at a certain temperature, and that freezer has to be calibrated daily. Okay. But I was thinking how, or on a regular basis, and I was like, we used to do satellite clinics. I was like, how? Yeah. Because if you can't offer all choices of vaccines, you can't pick and choose what ones you want to sure. offer. The health department can't. Sure. Unless, yeah, so that, that, unless that's all changed. But I, don't I don't think it has. But the other thing, and that's a good point, it, it's, it's this idea of if you bring in an outside entity, are they also servicing the public at the exact same time that your facility is open for students and staff? Mm -hmm. And there were a number of uh, people that expressed concerns with the ability to secure that site, um, how do we do traffic flow. And although I believe that from a vision perspective, it's probably the way we need to migrate. Um, I just fundamentally believe that the taxpayers look at all these different initiatives that get presented to them on an annual basis, different ballots, different millage proposals. And you know, as a taxpayer, as we all are, you kind of sit back sometimes and wonder, don't these groups ever talk to each other and see what they can do together to offer something that maybe you know, is, is a uniform service or, or sharing of staff or sharing of a facility. And so our attempt at that, Jan, I think was the first step for the community in terms of let's, let's take a step back and see what services do we offer. Let's not compete with some of these folks. Let's share services, let's share staff, let's share facilities. From a legal perspective, 
when you're talking about one publicly funded entity compared to another, there really aren't as many barriers as you might anticipate, right, in sharing services. Where it does begin to get sticky is if you bring in a for-profit entity and they're using a facility that was government funded, right? So for us to bring in, you know, we had conversations with the library, for example, legally speaking, there aren't a whole lot of barriers to that, right? Um, they levy operational dollars, so you've got to kind of figure out how do you navigate that in terms of their staffing, their operational costs, their technology costs. Um, but those are just logistics concerns. I think we're probably um, a few steps away from having a facility that, that looks like that vision. Though. Well, I'm sorry, it's here. Yeah. It's not here. Yeah, great question. So as we go through this today, and uh, the reason why you were given the numbers in advance, um, there's 250 lineups, so there's a lot, of, a lot of things included in here. Um, but just to give you a, an historical perspective, we originally, when we did the focus panels and focus groups throughout a range, we think we'll be able to do what we're proposing somewhere between 75 and 125 million. The current range is between 89 and 103, and that's very specific. We've gotten very granular with these recommendations. And Barton Mellon, the construction management company that we work with, their original estimate to us was 126 million. So we're really proud of the fact that we've gotten this thing down into a very, very manageable number, um, and it gives the board a wide range of option, very specific recommendations that you can make to us about items you want included or excluded in the final proposal, and yet the final number for the taxpayer is very palatable, and we'll get to that momentarily. So the priority one cost, this, this sheet, the total of all of the green column items per building is here. The major items included are on the far right column and certainly do not represent the totality of what we're proposing, but someone, for example, might look at Lynch third from the bottom and say, $447,000, if you're closing the building, what is that for? And I referred to it earlier in the original um, slide, which essentially, to maintain the viability of that site, if we don't sell it immediately, meaning you want to maintain heat, you want to secure the facility so it can't be broken into and vandalized, because the minute you shut off all electricity and heat to these buildings, they begin to degrade significantly and that affects the marketability of them. So we have set aside money in the bond um, to, to put money into that. But you look at each building that will be maintained in the district, and you can see the major items that the total project costs include. It's important to note, from a bond perspective, that these are estimates, right? We work as, as, as hard as we can with all parties involved. We have legal firms, we have our social management company, the architects, we've got our own internal team that scrutinizes these numbers. If in fact, there, there are many variables that impact uh, the ultimate tax burden on the community, uh, the major one being property values, right? So as property values continue to rise, you need to levy uh, fewer mills to get the same amount of money out of them, and the bond uh, tax burden becomes lessened. If we don't spend every dime of this money, the tax burden in the community becomes less because we, didn't, we don't have to levy mills to raise that money. So you try to articulate these numbers as close to what you think you'll need as possible. So the 89 point eight million dollar option, which is option 1A, reduces $7.9 million from the priority one list. These are the major items that if the board said, Matt and team, what could you live without, what would you prioritize as a reduction to get the total bonded figure to less than 90? So we looked at each item and these are their proposed reductions that we would take out if pressed to do so. And we can provide rationale for any one of those um, should you require that. I won't go through every one of them, but uh, those are the, the team, the folks that we work with, our directors, uh, principals, um, you know, folks, a lot of input on this. And um, we also have a prioritized list of what we would reinsert 
if you asked us what do you think is the most important of, of this list. But that, those are the major items included in that 7.9 million to get us down below 90. So, yeah. Yep, go ahead. My, my one concern when I look at this list is I see the reduction of new buses. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things we really want to know what we need to do as part of this is our bus fleet. So can you explain to me how we can really take out 20 new buses? Yeah. Seems we really need to replace probably all of them. Is that, is that, is that brand new or used new? These are brand new. These are brand new, yeah. The short answer is because Linda said I could. <laughs> Linda, you're not allowed to talk when you're here. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, we want, the priority one list is what we want. But if given the choice between the reduction of other items, there's 250 line items, right? This is, this is where we're at. Can we, can we do it with 30 instead of 50? The answer is yes, but does it put strain on the long-term viability of rotating the fleet on a continuous basis like we do now? Um, does it mean that long-term we'll be buying new buses sooner? It does, mm -hmm. right? Um, but to get us through the next, I don't know, Mark, you want to articulate this better than I can. I mean, it's... Well, what I'm looking for is it going to put us in a similar position that we are today with kicking the can down the road and replacing the buses like we are currently kind of managing? Sure. But, or is it doing the right thing and getting us the buses on the plan that we need on the rotation? That is Before I answer that, we answer that question specifically. There's nothing on this list that isn't important. No, I know that. It's just the prioritization of what do we think is, can be lived without sure. and still deliver that overall Budget. program. Sure. Budget-wise, I see it from a different perspective because I think it is kicking the can down the curve. You go and replace everything, then in 20 years you're looking at the same situation. Well, let's well, what, we'll speak I'm to that. That's, that's, that's what yeah. I wanted. So I would rather yeah. see replace less and work toward a budget solvent to find more. We will speak to that issue. Right so here. that's a great point. I was going to say, yeah. I mean, it's valid. Most districts shoot for somewhere between an eight and a 10-year replacement of your fleet. Depends on miles. Depends on state police inspections. A lot of variables, okay? Sure. Our winters, our weather, our corrosion, the salt, etc. Right now, we're on about a 16-year replacement for our 65 buses, buying four, as Jan pointed out, leased two-year-old, less than 40,000-mile buses. Mm -hmm. At the five million to replace the whole fleet would allow us to do some of what you're suggesting, get the fleet totally new, and start working towards a nine-year replacement so operationally we would start to have money set aside so that when we got to the ninth year we could buy 60 divided by nine and replace those buses now obviously we have two things going on as the enrollment's going down and the less we won't need as many to replace and what we've been doing for the last six to eight years is as we've had that shrinkage we're using our best old 12, 13, 14 year old buses as our reserves. So one breaks down, we still have that bus to put out on the road. So it wouldn't be necessarily what you're saying, Lisa, where we're gonna buy them all one time and not replace anything for 15, 20 years again. No, you would get back on that normal cycle from a budget every nine years, you know, in the nine year cycle, replacing those buses. What it does is buys you nine years to start building up some capital set aside for that first wave of replacements. As long as you can do that. <laughs> because we have to yep. put that as a priority. Yep. And this, this really is a key. <laughs> <laughs> I expect to recognize that. I was going to say. So last time I was involved with approving bus purchases, we bought them from a neighboring school district that weren't that old and only driven on paved roads, right? I mean, so. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. That's fine if they. If they <laughs> Problems. That's true. That's what the lease buses that we've been buying for the last five years. But that's not the same. That's not taken into consideration. I see Mr. Thomas in the back. They have changed just the mechanic rules from the engines, the transmissions, the allowable component parts of what you have to. So this is, it's a dynamic model. It's constantly changing. So 
yes, some of those are out there, Jan, but they may not, we may not be able to buy those in a few years if they keep changing the rules. So, so currently we have, but I don't anticipate that'll last forever. We know, for example, state police have changed the rules and made it much tighter on their annual inspection, what they're allowing, of what they allowed for the last four years. So we, have, we do get concerned with the red tags, and if we get too many, we won't be able to have enough on the road in a given day until we get replaced. So again, the, our, our initial charge was as we, and these are just things that we've identified, right? The reason we gave you the detail is because you might say, well, how come this isn't, you know, on the list, and we would prefer moving that, or adding that, or adding that back in. And that's the deliberation point is, sure. hey, I don't think that we should reduce it by 20. If you reduce it by 10, I only save a million, but I want, to, I want to see a plan that has 40 new buses, not 30. That, that's, that's what we're here for, what you guys can live with and what you support. Man, I just want to be clear, the, even the dollars left on the Mayfield for me, and when, that's really contingent. You use those dollars if these places don't sell. Correct. Otherwise, the dollars go back. Go back. Are not used. Yeah. Correct. That was that was the um, reduces the bond. It reduces the bond. It was an easier reduction, obviously, because it's just a number that we have identified best best gas research based number of what it's going to take to secure the facilities and maintain them for X amount of time. You don't really know. It's just. You know, working with the construction management team and, and architects and getting the best gas we can. So, but when you start talking about bus reduction, that's a real number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a real number. <coughs> so the proposed project additions that if we included priority one, <laughs> priority two, and priority three items, priority two includes um, additional money put aside for furniture and furnishings, uh, where currently we have some new but the plan does call for a lot of utilization of existing furniture. That we would move stuff, we, we, you know, the 07 bond uh, paid for some new, a lot of new furnishings, so that stuff would be moved. Um, additional district technology improvements, um, more bleachers and an additional restroom facility at the athletic complex, priority three, uh, HVAC control panel upgrades, and then new auditorium and theater lighting upgrades at the East Auditorium. So those were things that we identified as important, but not a priority one and not part of our recommendation. But should the board require additional rationale as to why those weren't included, or you desire to see them added into priority one, we can have that discussion as well. So if you asked us uh, what would we reinsert to priority one if we didn't cut it, here's what we would do. We would say the most important things are the roof at the east site. The buses, elementary site demo costs, putting those back in to, to make sure we had enough money to cover those costs, and then district technology that, in, in that order. Have a rank order of what we would, what we would do. And then that is also subject to your, your discernment, your, you know, your debate as a board about you know, maybe we think technology is more important than, than the roof, and we want to have that conversation. So as we have been presenting, um, be using uh, the most recent data of SEV that we have available, uh, at $100 million in a 24-year, three-and-a-half-month bond term, it would be an increase in the debt levy of 2.38 mills. It would equate to the average homeowner of about $14.83 a month, or about $177 on an annual basis. And as I said, uh, any number of variables can impact that. So if we request a bond amount less than 100 million, if property values rise, that SEV is based on last year's information at, uh, at 74,853 uh, average SEV of the home in Lapeer. Uh, that variable can impact it. Any number of things could lessen or increase that, uh, that amount depending on what the board decides to do. But this is just a good, solid number based on the information we currently have on hand. As a frame of reference, we wanted to compare um, similar size districts in uh, multiple counties. The total amount of current debt they have on the books and the amount of mills that they levy in each of those communities. So in Lapeer, if we were to achieve the 2.38 
millage increase by an affirmative vote of the community that put our total millage debt levy at 5.18, which means we'd still be lower than seven of eight of our surrounding communities and in uh, similar size districts and similar communities. I, we only utilize this as a frame of reference, not, it's not good or bad, we, you know, we didn't dive into the detail of each of these bond campaigns, what they funded with that money, but it just gives you a frame of reference that what we are proposing is not out of, um, out of line with what other neighboring districts are levying, and still uh, we have a millage rate that's significantly less than our neighbors. So the timeline looks like this. Uh, today's presentation, deliberation, March 6th, we'd ask the, the board to vote on both the strategic plan and the bond election language, which we'll send you in advance to review. Uh, if supported by you, the campaign would officially begin on March 7th. November 5th is election day. And uh, if we get an affirmative vote, we'll begin the transition planning for the 2022-23 school year and it would not be complete until August of 2022. So the real work of this process from this point on is, is fine-tuning what recommendations you as a board support. If, if we vote to the affirmative to support the report on March 6th, then, it, then the campaign phase begins. We have been in information collection and plan development since September. We have done our level best to get the best information possible. And now we've got to start making some decisions about what we really want to include in this plan. My personal perspective, I'm really proud of the team, really proud of the process. Um, I believe, honestly, that in the last eight years, we have demonstrated the ability to do more with less in this community, provide a much better academic and extracurricular program than we have in years past. All the data indicates that the district is on the rise. Uh, you saw our enrollment figures at our last presentation. Things are looking good from an FDE perspective for the first time in almost two decades. Uh, academic achievement is up. Uh, unparalleled success in the last four years continuing to trend in the right direction. Uh, we're financially stable, and we're providing more and better programs for our kids, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, so personally speaking, and, we, and we're adding money to the fund equity, we have three of the last four years. Uh, that, those are all good and healthy signs district is moving in the right direction. I think, although this is a very ambitious plan, the fact that we can save an estimated million to a million and a half dollars of operational costs by streamlining these programs, I think is very good. It demonstrates, again, our fiscal responsibility. We have to spend money to do that. What is the cost of doing nothing? The cost of doing nothing is we have about $30 million in identified major renovations and upgrades that have to happen to make the current facilities viable. That is money, folks, we currently do not have. We are going to close buildings, irrespective of what the board decides on March 6th. So if the board decides on March 6th for whatever reason, Matt, this plan is not what we, what we had hoped. Um, we don't want to support it. Or if you do support it and the bond vote fails in November, uh, we will continue to lose students. That trajectory has remained unchanged. And we will not require 13 buildings to manage around 4,000 students in 10 years when we get to that number. So we will have to figure out a way to close buildings, reassign staff, redraw attendance boundaries, redo transportation, and reduce our overall operational cost. We would not have the capital to do that in the short term. So it would be a very slow bleed over the next 8 to 10 years and we would be proposing cuts to academic and extracurricular programs to make our budget balanced on an annual basis. That is just a fact of, of doing business. What I wanted to do was present a plan that was modest, but was a, as best can be, a once and for all solution for our district from a, a configuration perspective. And when you look at the, the six, the five buildings, Turrell, Bowen Warner, Zemmer, the middle school site, and the brand new high school, and had Shipper there, you're going to have our best facilities um, available for all students um, for a number of years to come. And, and that is a solution that uh, even if we gain students, let's say the, the worm turns and um, we get new development, we 
we have room in those buildings to grow, but they can house the number of students we currently have and what we will be reduced to uh, as the data tells us we will be uh, reduced to around 4,000 students. So uh, I'm confident in, in the campaign and just based on the number of interactions I've had with a variety of community groups, I was asked today at Murphy and hey, people can speak to this, uh, somebody said, are you surprised that there isn't greater resistance? And the honest answer is that I am. I thought that uh, elementary communities would be um, really, really up in arms about losing their neighborhood schools. I was particularly concerned about Murphy. Pleasantly surprised by the reaction we got there. There is a lot of open-mindedness reaction to this. A lot of people saying things like, the writing's kind of on the wall, uh, the heavy lifting was done with the high school merger, people expect this type of change, they're more prepared for it than they have been in years past. Um, so I, I was, I'm surprised by that, but also cautiously optimistic that we have to continue to educate people as to why this money needs to be spent, what are the benefits of it, and what are the financial and educational benefits of why we're doing it. So with that, I, I leave it to you and open it up to questions, both about the configuration and or the bond. And then what I really need to hear from you guys, like the bus issue, for example, is what items do you want to see as part of the final proposal that way I can get to a bottom line number and draft a resolution that you can support. Can I ask a question about the mills? Sure. So mills are determined by the number of mills you've levied is based on your property values in the county. Mark, do you want to give up? The number, of mills that, that. the number of mills that will be required to be levied is a function of your outstanding debt of principal and interest. So first variable that comes into is when you sell the bonds, there's, there's a multitude of ways that you can structure it. Some you pay higher interest in the front end, some you pay an even straight line across it, some you do it on the back end. So depending on how that schedule looks, it changes your principal and interest payments. That's really what drives the amount of money needed, so that drives the amount of mills based on the total tax plus CV value exactly. That's at what the I mean. time. So if you're comparing between districts, you also have to look at property Correct. values. Correct. There are there's definitely different variables. I was going to say, Lots because, of right? Yeah. Okay, that's what I'm yeah. trying to, we're going to have to gain more because we don't have as high, right? right. We have and to levy more because of Property value has been growing. <clears throat> State CPI is 2.8. I'm going to guess the Pier County property values, when we see it come out here very shortly, if they haven't already started to come to homeowners, will be somewhere in that <clears throat> two and a half on upwards. You may see some folks pushing towards double digits, point frankly, in certain pockets, because it's all based on assessors, and there's much better formulas than there used to be 10, 20, 30 years ago. But that's what's driving. The economy, if you just look at the general economy, CPI, cost of living increase, has been in that two and a half, three percent. You'll see that. So um, that's what we're anticipating when we did our what if scenario originally for the numbers that Matt put up the 177 based on 100 million, that was at roughly a one and a half percent property value growth over the future years to come up with that estimate. My strategic is just going crazy in the fact that does anyone have any data on what's like a baseline that taxpayers are willing to what do you mean like from the state? Like our consultants, do they know that if you go over 125 million, you're not going to get passed or anything like that? No, those are really um, community specific numbers and figures. Um, it's really more about what is the actual dollar burden on an annual basis that they kind of focus on. Uh -huh. What they have done, consultants have done, is take a baseline of the community right now and they look at things like um, perception of the district perception of the communication of the plan, um, direct benefit they see to them, uh, direct benefit to the community. So they take a more kind of holistic look at it, and then based on that, they'll say, um, and they will take they will take a temperature gauge kind of throughout the process, like every quarter, okay? You've had two months of campaigning and information of the community. Where are they at now? Does that move the needle at all? Um, so it really, it isn't a function so much of the number per se, they look at your electorate and they say, and they find out what is their palette for what you're selling, right? And right now they said, without any campaigning, uh, their initial figures show us at about a 0.44, which means 44% uh, of people without a lot of information support the plan. And you've got to get 
seven points uh, in the next, you know, until November to get it passed. That is a really good starting point without, so without information. How are they doing that? Are they mobile companies? People? Are they, what are they sending? What are they doing? How so are they, they getting this information yep, from the people they, that have heard about this for less than Yeah, months? these are professional, um, these are professional uh, uh, bond election uh, firms. Okay. And they have, um, access to uh, voter records, voter color information, um, um, history. They have done surveying and auditing uh, in the community, uh, and they also have worked with us in 2007, so they compare that data to um, not only school district elections, but other, like the Rhodes Village, the Library Village, other uh, initiatives in the, the community. They know up here very well, and based on that information, that's what they provide us. They, they helped us pass the 07 bond, and they also work with me personally in the merger of the two high schools. I have a question. It's been a community concern about an understanding that over a million dollars was put into Maple Grove when in 07, 08, with that bond, around that number. Mm -hmm. So what's the issue with the road, the Maple Grove, of 300, needing $335,000 at the road? At the roof is shot. So we didn't do anything to the roof 10 years ago? Um, I can, we did not. We did, no. oh. it was, it was patched. We didn't do that gym area, we did the rest of it. Yeah. Okay. So we've got, you know, we, we have been patching that roof for a number of years. Uh, so we didn't do the gym area at the roof? Yeah, the rest was up. Just, I mean, that's feedback I've heard in the community. Sure. That yeah. required, we did not, um, we put a lot of money into people going with that bond issue. In addition, that was one more money. But it's self sustaining, right? Mm -hmm. That, that's a tricky one because it's like, do we put the money in to maintain the relationship with CMH? If we decided to close the building and sell it, um, you know, they, they would have to find another option to do so. Um, but because it's neutral operationally, it's not costing us anything, so it's, it's a, just a discussion to have. Uh, there's also uh, the possibility, and you know, I'll say it publicly, but with the asterisk next to it, you know, is there a possibility of cost sharing with CMH? Uh, relative to some of those facility improvements that they would be willing to do. We've had conversations with them in the past about uh, purchasing the facility from us. There are some limitations legally that they're dealing with as a, as a government entity to purchase property. Um, leasing is really there's very few limitations, so we've had that conversation as well. But it's also why we removed it as a priority one item and took it out as, a, as an itemized reduction recommendation. Is there any data on how much construction costs have increased in the past five years, so 2017? Mark, Bart Mel provide us any like per unit cost in terms of construction? I haven't, but we know that the treasury allowable rates on two hundred dollars a square foot for actual brick mortar. There's a higher number when you do all in from all your mechanicals and lighting and stuff, but that's part of their expertise that they lend in the partnership here of giving those costs. And there's a inflationary factor they factor into okay. based on recent. Now, that said, if you had some astronomical, you know, simultaneous uh, world casualties of hurricanes all at the same time, and there's a shortage of gypsum or building materials, then obviously you get spikes in valleys um, or petroleum. Petroleum has been very steady. You hear me talk about that in the budget. You know, if we see a spike in petroleum going to 100, 120 dollars a barrel again from its current 40 to 50, yeah, you're going to see a cost. Is it really to two times the cost that we just talked about? No, but there would be a 10 or 15 percent premium. You know, with, with money this much, you're looking at a small increase can cause. And what and what you have in the overall bond issue like this is you're going to have positive bond variance on bids, and you're going to have negatives. So some are going to go over the original estimate, some are going to come under. And by the time you get to the end, it usually works itself to the relative number where you're at. If you don't use the amount, can you pay the bond back early? Like the contingency, let's say we go for the contingency, you can give it back. I mean, yes, yeah. right? I mean, if you sell if you sell it off, because it's another variable, because how many series do you do it in? One series or multiple series? Let's say you do it in two or three series. And third series, you sell, but you don't use five million of that. 
and yeah, you just turn around and pay off your principal and interest, which just lowers your interest debt, which again goes back to my original answer to you, then your future mills required to cover principal and interest debt goes down, so you get a savings there. So safety and security, that's been an issue that's peaked in Valley. We're confident now that with this, we're going to see some, I can say, significant increases in security in the buildings that we will end up keeping open. Yes. Definitely. When you look at the itemized breakdown length, you'll see things like single point entry and more video cameras, integration of those things, um, things that multiplied over multiple buildings become really cost prohibitive, but we can really hunker down into those six facilities we can move forward. Okay. Yeah. So, for instance, when we've been, use this room when it's been hot in here, 
in the springtime. I'm texting Mr. Meisner at home, and he's on his computer, and he's actually adjusting the, the system and turning the AC on remote. What Mark actually says is Matt looks like he's sweating. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the heat down. So it allows you to manage. It has nothing to do with temperature. <laughs> it, it's, that allows us to site manage, but what it really does is allows us to have all the setback temperatures from night at midnight to 6 a.m. on weekends to manage your whole facility without an individual around touching every thermostat. I get that, but I also see it's millions of dollars. It is, and we already have a system, and that's why you see it's way over in the third right, level. Right. But at some point, like everything that's technology related, systems you have become obsolete, sure. and there's better and more efficient systems that come down the road. That was basically the made of professionals. There's probably better stuff we already have, but as Mark says, it works, it's working, so we don't need to replace it. So that's why it's priority three for us. Right. And with respect to security, I mean, there are, I don't know that we have a finalized you know, plan or footprint, and even if we do, I hope we don't share it. But I see specific numbers of cameras for each building. I mean, those aren't hard and fast, I don't think. Are what they're based on, Mike, is overall square footage. Okay. So in a 200,000 square foot facility, this is the number of cameras we recommend. But based on the configuration, the design internally, it may be more, maybe less. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So is there an overall target number that the board is really focused on that we present in two weeks on the sixth that you're going to be comfortable with? I don't have a target number, but I want to reiterate something that Mike and Mike said. You know, we're going to take time to do it. We better do it right. You know, I remember, in, I think it was 2004, 2005, you, know, you guys voted to redo the parking lot at West. Within two years, it's crumbling. Right, if we're going to do this, we better make sure that the people we hire to do it are doing it the right way, first off. Second off, if this doesn't pass, I remember sitting in finance and operations committee meetings with you and Peggy and Gary, and we would debate for three, four hours, are we going to go with you know, cleaning schools on alternate days? Certainly don't want to go back to those days. Those were not so fun debates. So if we're going to do this, you know, priority one, you have the roof at, at ease. Might as well do it. Put it in there. What we did, and this is, and that's that's a good point. You know, when we sat down, and there were seven different meetings with Mark and his team, Mark Mel and their team both additions and deletions to this plan. And what I want to commend both Mark and Mark doing is going to folks like Doug Lindsay and Michelle Bradford and people and Ken, people in the buildings. Hey, this is what Mark Mello suggests. Does this work? And when they really want to get a pat on the back from me, people like Doug Lindsay would say, Matt, they've got way too much here, we can reduce it. That's the right answer, Doug. Keep finding those reductions, right? But they are just using rough estimates. And you really got to drill down into the specifics of what does our program need from the facility's perspective to support the work we're doing. And so these numbers are as close to accurate as we can get them because the building hasn't been designed yet. Right? These are just, we need X amount of square feet for science, X amount of square feet for storage, X amount of square feet for office space. Right? The average classroom will need X amount of square feet. You extrapolate that out, these are the numbers that you're looking at, okay? The, the design process has yet to happen. They'll take these raw figures and we will design the facilities to mirror that. And what our people have already done the heavy lifting of is we don't need, you know, an excess square footage in these particular areas. This is what we need. This is what we currently have. These are our needs. So when we really get into the campaign phase of this, we can defend these numbers to the death because we know our people have told us we can run a great facility with this amount of square footage or this this amenity or, or not have that amenity. So that's why we're very confident in the number. But we also had to say, okay, what are some things, and a good example is the restroom renovation at Schickler. This is credit to Mark Meiser. So there's a couple hundred thousand dollars and they're going to convert all those elementary size restroom facilities 
to be secondary age appropriate. Mark, Mark said, hey, that's a reduction we can make. We can do it a lot cheaper if we do it internally, our own people. We're not paying the markup, contingency fees, architectural fees, engineering fees. We can do that. Now, that's something on a small scale. I'm not going to have Mark do that to build a wing of the new high school with our people, but we can renovate restrooms. So we were able to take out a couple hundred thousand dollars from Priority One to say we can do that. So we did look to the idea of you know, what number of buses could we purchase with general fund? How much longer will the roof at East last? Can we do that as a special project four or five years down the road? So those conversations have happened. It's a sharing of costs between you know general fund expenditures and the bond and that shell game, Brad, of you know what goes where. But to your point, we heard you in committee. This is not. We we want a, a program that does two things simultaneously, right? Gets everything we think we need, but also doesn't go overboard. So the community says, what what is this? You've got you know um, this special amenity over here, and the superintendent's office is you know 25 by 25 feet and bolted ceilings and that kind of stuff. That's where districts get in trouble, right? They think. This is our last chance. Right. <laughs> no, I have the same office in the plan. It'll be happy to know. I want to make sure we're not this quote here. No. I have the marks and a punch of skylight in the ceiling for me. I think the biggest thing to think about, people look at this number and it's a big number. Construction costs are high. It's not like your typical house, and we're comparing it to our personal budget. And I think what's most difficult, I teach this in economy, I teach nonprofit, is that given an amount of money, it's going out that year. It's it's an in and out kind of like your household. And if you don't make, you know, contingencies or savings account at your household and don't plan to repair your roof or put a new roof on, it eventually is gonna add up. And I think that's what it's ballooned because for the last ten years at least we haven't got the dollar amount for the extra to do because our funding has literally decreased and that's dictated by the state. So I think that you have to look at it from that perspective that we could say, oh, well, we'll buy 10 buses later, but we really don't know where the state's going to sit as far as funding is concerned. So, you know, again, it's just, I think, again, to take back a step back is that, again, this is bare bones, it's doing what we have to do. And it is going to cost. I mean, it's, it's a dollar amount that's expensive. That's the thing that I really like the best about this plan is all the feedback that you got from the community. And now, if you sit back to where where we originally said this is what we want it to look like and this is where it's being proposed today is really taking a look at the buildings that we already spent dollars at, right, in 2007. We spent dollars at and mostly that's the, the students that are gonna remain in those buildings. Um, and then really taking just a look at what is our better buildings at the moment of conditions and reutilizing as much as we can to come up with a bond at a dollar value that isn't the Taj Mahal. We're really looking at building the best for our students because we want that best 4,000, right? But utilizing um, all the structural and even the assets that we have within it, right? Because yes. you're looking at even in your, I think, priority two, furniture, um, you know, furnishings. So we're looking at what can we utilize now? So, I mean, I really support the plan. I don't know if it's what is the right number, um, but what I want is to make sure that we're incorporating the things that we really need to do today that helps build that best 4,000 student district for us in the future. One of the things we talked about, and I've mentioned this with some of the community groups I've spoken with, is you look at, a, let's just use a current elementary school as an example. They have um, a principal, either a building character or even students and a full-time secretary. And people look at, you know, the average elementary school, let's say it's got 400 students, and they say, wow, we're going to have this very large elementary school. That's going to be a lot for those three people to handle. Well, obviously, we would look to take out some of the savings and, and provide those that building with greater service. You know, a principal, perhaps an associate principal, a full-time dean of students, 
maybe more than one secretary. There's going to be a lot going on in that, in that building. So I don't want people to think that this is about cutting the repair of loans. We're going to save money operationally if we do this plan. That is a fact. That you cannot fight that is a fact. When you, when you close three buildings and, and reduce the operation by that much in one year, you will save operational dollars. Out of that savings, we as a board have to identify what services where parents and students find most valuable that we have cut over the last eight to 10 years, like deans, like building paras, like that office support, the things that were really servicing people, and how do we re-inject some of that? Because we have fewer buildings now, we can put that support in. Security is another one of those items, right? Full-time hall monitors. We have three full-time school resource officers, right? That we put money into people because that makes the most difference in things like customer service and security. You can buy all the gadgets and technology in the world, but if you don't have good people, right, and we've had to reduce some of those positions to make our budget meet every year. So I don't want to get into the position of it's building versus people. Uh, personally, I'm not married to brick and mortar. To me, it's about the academic program, the experience kids have inside the classroom. It's not about the address in the front of the building, it's about that experience inside the four walls of our classroom and the people that we can bring to bear to provide that service. That's what we have to be fixated on and focused on. And I, and I feel like this plan gets us there. Yes, is it, is it emotional to lose a neighborhood elementary school? No one can argue that. No, you're, and, you're, and you're naive to think that there aren't emotional attachments to our buildings. These are good buildings. These people aren't doing anything wrong. It's not like we're unhappy with Murphy or unhappy with Mayfield or Lynch or Shipper or whatever. They're doing great things. And those buildings have developed cultures inside of them, not just within the staff and students, but the neighborhoods. This plan, I feel, yes, transition is always hard, but it provides a better academic program because of the consolidation of services that I'm not multiplying times five, the consolidation and collaboration of our staff who are now all under one roof, the fact that our kids begin and end their entire Lapeer Community Schools experience together. We begin to build that Lapeer identity as E5s and kindergartners, and we matriculate through all together. To me, that's really important. And I am fortified when I talk to the community, yet that idea of one Lapeer really resonated with people when we did the merger, and they see this plan as in line and congruent with that concept. And it's hard to argue. And that's really when you look at the far left, when you looked at all those transitions, they, people didn't articulate it, but they felt this is too choppy, right? There's too much transition. It's not as congruent and consistent and smooth as we'd like it to be. And then it was funny to watch people's reaction to what we eventually presented to you when they saw it. They're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That that's what we were. That's what, that's that makes sense. And and so I was. I looked at all 600 sets of eyeballs, right? Looking in, at, and presenting this as many times as, as I have. So, and I, I'm just very confident that this reflects what people were trying to tell us in those community forums. So, I know, clarify the year round, is year round gone with this, or is it in interwoven? Like interwoven, and it's one of our original bullet points was we're going to keep the year round program as an option, Jan, right. for all students in grades kindergarten through eighth grade that we currently have. Okay. And actually, one of the parents at Murphy this morning brought up a really good point, which we had talked about. A lot of people who like the year round, just let's say if you're a Murphy parent or you're a Lynch parent, didn't want to move schools, right? You say, I like the year round concept, but just from our family and driving kids to and from and picking up for soccer practice and ballet, it doesn't make, it doesn't work for us. But if it's there and it's an option and it's available for all, heck, I might do it, right? So we actually feel this is going to be a, a boost to the year-round program because it's in every building, Turrell, the East Campus site, Golden Warner, and Zucker. Why is my home calling me right now? They know where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> Kids. Children. Yeah. So that's, that's a, uh, and really, the original plan, if you look at it, says that we were going to maintain the year-round program at elementary. That got the most pushback from Turrell. Which really, that was my first kind of like, maybe I'm not really good at developing plans because they, they did not, the staff and the students and the families there said, we don't want to be on an island until fifth grade 
where everyone else in the district is combined and, and going through together, and then our kids join them as sixth graders. Staff said, well, everybody gets to collaborate except for us. We're out here on an island to ourselves, and we don't we want to be a part of that. So that was just, but they were nervous because, hey, this, we don't want the year-round schedule to end because don't forget, all those teachers and administrators, they selected to be in turn. They selected that schedule. Every person in there chose to be there. And there's a power in choice, right? We chose it, we want it. So they were just happy to know that we were still going to continue to offer it the same way we do now, the school within a school model. Um, and that was really the first major change to this plan. Okay, so if Terrell doesn't want to be a standalone K-5, that was option one. It was like, okay, we got to redo this. We put those options out, the focus panels, focus groups. People are like, eh, not feeling it. And uh, it, that's what got us to where we're at. Sit back and nope. we're going to vote yes on November 5th, but we got this. 
it, but it's a just it's a stat plus or minus a couple percentage yeah. points. No. If it was twenty, if it was twenty, right, we would be and, and they and these consulting companies also determine whether or not they're going to continue to work with districts and municipalities and towns based on some of those numbers. Sure. They might tell you this is not the right time to do this. The current audit numbers and the formula tells us you don't have the support. It's a major uphill battle. If you've got to get 35 points, it ain't going to happen. But when you're less than 10, you know, then it's about the campaign. We can, we can educate the community to get, to get seven, eight points. I know we talked about this, but do you know if there are going to be any, any other ballot proposals? In we still don't know. Okay. So the clerk's office has had Mary calls, what, every once a week? <laughs> yeah. We, we anticipate there will be some. I don't know. I don't. I don't think they have to know something that coming for until July or something. Yes. So, yeah. So I guess I wanted to address a point that Lisa and someone brought up about the bus. We've been playing bus numbers for years, and the problem is, is that when you start to set aside for buses, then that becomes also a very desirable pool of funds to go raid. At some other point, you need something else. And so, I don't really want to see you cut the bus number personally. I mean, we're going to be moving more kids, in some cases, further than we have in the past. And we're going to need some serious buses and some beefed up buses to do with. Is that, is that a universally, is that worth, I'd say a lot of nodding heads? I just know that also is from the forums and things that you've heard, is busing is so important. To these parents in this district. And if we continue to shave back on what we want to do to help support this overall plan, it just makes me a little nervous. I mean, I know we could work it in the budget somewhere, but like you just said, Mike, it could be something that we could take away to do something like the roof. If the roof needs repair, obviously we're going to probably pick the roof, right? We just put money into this building, we're going to need to put the roof, um, repair it, or do the right thing and put a new roof on, right? So we would pick that over buses again because we try to just kick that can a little bit down the road because the bus garage does such a great job already, yeah. right? Well, and that's really, that's if you look at that itemization, we've put significant dollars into the bus garage to pay the entire lot, upgrade that facility. It desperately, mm -hmm. desperately needs it in addition to the new buses. So sure. that because, and I think to your point, because the burden on the bus garage will be increased, yeah. going from three to two tiers, Right, keeping trying to keep those runs as close to an hour as possible. That we want to make sure they have the resources available to do that job. Yeah, we haven't fixed our darn roads yet, so we're right. still working on that. Yeah, I'm not the fence about the buses because I think we can. If we're talking about one hundred four thousand students. I don't think we need quite as many buses in the future. So I, I'm at the forty, not quite at fifty buses. Yet. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I think that again, you could do some leasing and get by until that time. And if you're saying now most of the elementaries live on the east side of 24. No, I didn't no. say that. I, no, I said that the buildings that service the elementary oh, school kids are on the east side. Yeah, with Sorry, the education. Mike mm -hmm. mentioned earlier, since we've been on the board, since all five, we've cut the budget every single year. And where was one of the things as we went through the list was putting off and putting off and putting off getting buses. And they have done an awesome job. <laughs> With the buses we bought that were used, or even keeping. Linda, did you buy everyone a fruit basket before this <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what's going on? But I, yeah, I agree. I okay. don't want I mean, eighty to forty, but I don't want to see us go down to twenty. Good. Yeah, I, yeah, we can't do that too much. And I'm for the east too. I, I think that if that's a lot of money. If we don't include it, we're just looking at the problem in the future. The rough. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what all around in there. I don't want to see buckets all over. But, you know, you're going to let a bunch of little kids in there. I don't yeah. want buckets throughout the hallway. Yeah. Somewhere. So, looking at the trying to, for everybody, something at the front page here, the possi possible priority one reductions. If we just go through the list one by one, the two no brainers in my mind, that, because you've already touched on one, that we can get rid of right off the bat. This is Chicago restaurant renovations. So if we can do a cheaper in-house, and probably better in-house, right, Mark? Because we got really good employees. Then I say let's 
cut that one right up from the get-go. Same with the furniture at the new high school. And then the roof, is the roof that people go just on the gym? What's that? The roof at Maple Grove? Is that it's the last addition that was put on the school. Oh. It's a gymnasium open area. Is it leaking? It's been leaking. Okay. <laughs> because the other ones on this list, with the exception of maybe the, the reduced number of buses from 50 to 40, we got to have a roof at Maple Grove and the high school. I think we've shown a good past, present, or past ability to get rid of our buildings or sell our buildings that we closed. So I, I'm in agreement with reducing the number of yeah. I, th I don't think so. I'll be around for them. That is also an area where there's, there's no blood there, right? There's no, we're not cutting a program and reducing anything. It's an estimated figure in the way. I don't want to see us get rid of the continuity. Because right there, our area puts us at over a million dollars. I've seen districts get in big trouble when they're too small on what they ask for. Huge trouble, and then they couldn't build. So. I think we've got one chance to do it, do it right. I 
I, I don't want to go over the top. I think uh, Mr. Mason was absolutely right. I think this is the point where people will pay attention because now there's going to be a number. Yeah. And I think what I'm concerned about is some of the folks who said, yeah, I'm, I'm all for this. They didn't know a number. They changed their mind a little bit. Um, 24 percent. Right. right. Well, don't forget, that's interrupt. Right. don't forget, every single focus group, we put that range out there from 75 to 125. And I said in every single public forum, I think will be around $100 million. Right. I said that every time I presented this. Mm -hmm. So there is an awareness that that is a figure that's worth floating around. Right. 99 mills sounds different, don't you? I agree. So it's it's just about yeah. 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 Everything on TV is 1999. Yeah. 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 Priority one is the uh, is our recommendation. Right. I think for 97.7, with everything that's included in priority one, we can have a one heck of a great plan. I, I we believe that. If the team has poured over this. Um, to to your point, keep it. Under 100, get it close to as 90 as possible, and it just it's more digestible. I think. The number of the six in my head is 95. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, and this is why I say is this is the time you go back to the contract. You say how badly do you want to build a building? Because if we can get it to a magic number of 95, we're more likely to get there, and they can help you get there. We just sit Mark Meister on and we can yeah. get it. <laughs> And it may not mean that much per, I, I get my point about, it may not mean that much per person's household. Per month, per year. But the number itself just here. Yes. Yes. And I still have people that ask me okay. that haven't heard about it. Because I think people are going to look at how it's going to affect them. It always comes down to how does it affect right. me? Exactly. How is it going to affect their budget they have to live with? But a better school district is going to increase the growth. That's bottom line. In the long run, if they're looking to sell it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what I also want, and I need to do this as part of what you're putting together, I, I want to know those pieces that help us not only improve our, our, the environment for our staff and students, but make it better for our community. Because, let's face it, we need more people in our community don't have kids in school and do. That's right. And, you know, it, it's always, you know, what does this do for me? How, how does this help me? Yeah, I, I think we've done a really good job. You've done a really good job of promoting a sort of sense of community. And I think we need to keep that going. And I think there are lots of things that offer advantages for our community by having a great school district. You know, you've you heard it. They say it at city meetings. You know, a, a great community, a good community depends on a great school district. That's right. That's right. That's right. They all know that. Yeah, and I, I think to keep our community viable, and we need young people here. We need to draw those young people here. And we need to keep and retain the great staff that we have. We need to do all of these things and keep these things in place. But I, people want to know how does that help me? And I think if we can develop those talking points and get those out there early, not that you haven't already, I know you have. But, we have, but, but what we've got, I think, is a great feedback from a really small number of people. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. And, and it's, it's a bit of an echo chamber, which is why there's cautious optimism. Right. Um, but I will say this. Um, I did receive the same feedback when I talked to the same group of people about the murder of the high school. Right. Right. Okay, it was the same group of people, same types of folks I was asking at those initial. Um, and then I thought that would be the short of the tenure and look here as a superintendent. Uh, after my first couple community forums, I'm like, I don't think they like this idea a whole lot. Kim assured me that we would get it done. She was right. Um, but to your point, people ask me all the time, why do you speak to sixth graders about this plan? Um, I'll tell you one small anecdote. Um, number one, I talk to sixth graders and seventh graders and tenth graders and twelfth graders because I want them to know what's happening in their school district, whether it impacts them personally or not, because they are going to be the future parents, taxpayers, citizens, business owners in this community. And you want them to leave their school experience with a positive feeling, not only that they got a good experience out of what they, what they went through, but that their school district 
is also making positive changes. So that is a, vari a variable that prevents them from moving back here. That's number one. Number two, uh, they are great ambassadors, right? As parents, we're very selfish. Nine times out of 10, if our kids are happy, we're happy, right? I, I went and spoke to a group of Rowan Warner uh, student council students. The next day, I spoke for about, about 45 minutes. The next day, a teacher in our district sent me a video of two of those girls standing in front of their classroom advocating for this and articulating everything I told them, ins and outs of the plan, what buildings were uh, being considered for closure, what the new configuration might look like. Our students are keenly aware of what we're talking about right now. And they were really thirsty for information. And so don't think they're not paying attention. And I want those kids to go home and say to mom and dad, we talked to the superintendent. Here's why they're doing it. Here are some benefits. Here are some drawbacks. Here's what we think. Because for the most part, if our kids feel like they're a part of the, we're doing it for them. But oftentimes as adults, we do it for them without asking them anything about it. That's the biggest mistake school districts can make. Is these are your quote unquote customers. Why don't you ask them once in a while if what you think you're doing is working actually does. And there are things that we do that don't work. That, that's a fact. There's no one's saying this is the perfect school district. Everything we do is this golden nugget. Um, but there is a lot we do really well. And getting their feedback on this was really, really critical. At least in, in forming my opinion of what you see as a final plan. It was informed by, I hate to say it, some sixth graders had some great input. Speaking of things we do really well, I congratulate the girls bowling team. They're doing really well. And um, I went to the jazz band concert Friday night. I highly recommend everyone to go and listen to our jazz band. It's awesome. They are awesome. Well, thank you. Honestly, Matt, for taking all this extra time out of your schedule to meet with all these people, forums, clubs, everywhere in our community to really get the pulse, to be able to have your team work out all of these fine details that you presented us to be able to review and really make, you know, a very good decision for our district moving board. I mean, it, would, it took a lot of time and I appreciate every bit of it. All worth it. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to take everybody back. Some of you weren't quite here yet, but we've been around for a while. It was kind of a joke about 10 years ago. We said all we have to do is reinvent the whole system of education and we'll be fine. Because Lansing was throwing all of these things at us and we had all of these requirements and we needed that part of it we never stop. And everybody sat around the table like, how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to cope with all of these things? And that was sort of the running joke for a while. All we have to do is completely reinvent the process and we'll be great. We sort of have. And with the help of some really great folks, you've been able to put and face all of these things that have been thrown at us from Lansing. Well, this is the part we can control. This is the part we can control. And so this continues that mission and set us to everybody in the beer and to all those people that are coming. See, look, we actually do care. And we do take our commitment to our community seriously. And that we can put our best foot forward. And it's, frankly, if this goes through, we'll be sort of the last time that they're going to be asked to do this, hopefully for a very long time. And, you know, so to continue that sort of reinvention of the process, this is the logical next step. When we get this done, we got one more thing to tackle, and it's healthcare, and we're still gonna, we're gonna figure that one out too, in terms of rates and how we're gonna address that issue. But it, it, it is, you know, the, the footsteps coming down the hall. You know, this, this is not new. This is nothing, we're not sneaking up on anybody. We've been talking about this for a long time, which is, you know, the best way to do it and the best way to, to sort of put ourselves out there. It is a logical next step from all of the places that we've gone. And so, and it's somewhere you're right on the money. I could go home. Four o'clock, five o'clock, whatever, I'm going home. I have kids too in school. Maybe I'd like to go see them do something. He does, but he's still here. He goes and comes back. He makes a presentation, he makes a pitch, and, I, and all of you guys have to be exhausted because you go right along with him being prepped for all these things and you know, crunching the numbers on a daily basis. And you know, that, that's great to do better. You know, go figure it out. You know, Mark Meisner. Yeah, we can do this. We can do this better. We can do this ourselves. We can save money here. That's not going to end. And gee, if we don't spend all that money, or we save money along the way because other things are going to come, then hey, we don't have to levy all those.
tax, and you don't have to ask all that tax money. So we're going to have some more savings, I think, built into this along the way. All that being said, I, I am not looking for a giant number. Nobody is, because it affects me too. On the other hand, because I believe we only really have one shot at this, I want to get it right. And, you know, I'm glad you guys brought up like, the roof at East. I don't want to compromise on that. I don't want to do this, and then you have to go back later and say, geez, maybe we should have fixed the roof too. People are going to look at us and say, are you crazy? Why didn't you fix the roof? So, you know, I, I don't know that there is a magic number. It's all too high. It's all too much money. And but anything more than zero? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's a tax. You can throw that out there and have the people to say no. It doesn't matter if it was a dollar. It's, it's a new tax. We're going to do it. But we need to at least represent our district, represent our kids, and say this is the right thing to do. And so let's put it out there. Let's do it. And let's make that commitment. Because like I said, this is the piece we need to control. That's right. So, I think we always have to do it. Well, I just want to thank you for your input and to echo what Mike said, to thank the team because you're right, this has been a hard drive in several months. Um, they do look exhausted, you're right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you can get a nice sleep tonight because the real work starts tomorrow. Yes. But thank you to them for all their Thank you.